just want to make sure people are getting Jupiter Hub spun up. Um, and then as we've been doing throughout the week, um, cloning the CICE tutorials repository, that's C-ICE-tutorials. Um, and then uh, the, the channel for questions is going to be different because there's that um, other session that's going on at the same time. So the channel where you can ask questions is questions-CICE. Um, and I'm Ellen Buckley. I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland, and I've been looking at ISAT2 data in the summer and looking at the ISAT2 response to the melting sea ice surface and kind of looking at ISAT2's capability to measure melt ponds on the sea ice surface. Um, so yeah, I'm sure some of you guys probably know more about the data product than I do, and some of you guys are probably better at Python than I am, but uh, hopefully you guys can pick up something from this tutorial. Uh, the way that this tutorial is going to work is we have three notebooks, um, ATL03, ATL07, and ATL10. We're going to start in that order and I'm going to go through ATL03 and ATL07 and if we have time then Alec is going to get into ATL10 and if not that could be pushed to tomorrow morning during the advanced topic session. Um, but hopefully we'll have time to go through all that. Uh, but I'll pause and make sure I'm going at a good rate. Um, and yeah, if I'm going too fast or anything, you can uh, write that in the questions dash CIS channel. And then uh, the helpers for this are um, Axel and Jang, and they will be in that channel answering questions. And you guys can speak up if you need me to slow down. Uh, yeah. So, okay. I'm gonna go to my... Yeah, maybe while you're bringing that up, Ellen, just to say, yeah, if anyone has other questions or things they wanna talk about, we can try and put that into the session tomorrow too. Okay, so once you've um, cloned the repository, you should have a CIS tutorials folder in your home. Um, and yeah, in your home directory. Actually, I'm gonna do a little poll right now. If you guys are all set up, do you wanna give me um, a check yes or X no, uh, just to make sure we're all, and you can do that by going into participants and uh, checking. Okay, so if you guys are having issues, uh, you can write that in the questions channel, um, but I'll just give another second to see if people can get caught up. I'll go back to this because this is the repository that we're cloning here. Hopefully have some more people caught up. Um, I'm going to go right into the notebooks folder and starting with uh, ATL03, which is probably the lowest level of data that you will be interested in for studying sea ice. ATL03 is the, um, the global geolocated photon height um, and it's a very large data set. Um, and if you want more information on it, uh, you can go there's a great uh, technical references tab on the main NSIDC uh, page for the data product. And that has a lot of um, resources like the ATBD, the known issues document and the data dictionary. Those have all been really helpful um, for this, uh, for, for me, for like looking to see what different variables mean and stuff like that. Uh, this tutorial specifically will just use one file and I've put that file in, um, a shared folder. So that should work for you guys all to pull from. There are two share folders on the home directory. If you guys aren't aware of this, there's the tutorial data, which is the ones that, this is a protected one, so you can't write to it. Um, but this is where we'll be, I put the data for this tutorial in the CIS folder. Um, but then there's also this shared folder, and that's what you guys were writing to yesterday in the HDF5 tutorial. And that one, everyone else has access to. So if you go into that, there's all these other people's folders too. And that uh, is a great way to share uh, 
data, like external data through uh, the, uh, within your group projects if you want to use that folder. Just a hint. Okay, so what I'm gonna do in this notebook is just go through the ATL3, how I pull it in and what kind of um, parameters I pull in and how to plot it. Uh, there's a little bit of adjustment that you have to do for the along track distance and the time variables. So we're gonna kind of uh, go through that. And then also just uh, showing an example of a weak beam versus a strong beam just to see the differences and see if you want to use um, both beams or maybe just the strong beam is good enough for you guys. Um, yeah, so this one, this is, like I said, is really high resolution, large data sets. Um, and basically uh, it's for looking at high resolution features on the surface. And then if you're looking at something in ATL 7 and it doesn't make sense and you wanna like look at more detail, you can pull up the ATL 3 granule that goes with it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's really large and hard to manipulate. So, uh, don't recommend using it unless you really want to look at these high resolution features, but that's what I'm doing. So I use it all the time. Um, right. So starting with importing these modules, uh, you probably recognize most of these, but I'm also using CardoPy to map. I don't know if we've seen that yet. And then uh, Fernando was using this yesterday, the astropy.time time function that helps translate between GPS time and UTC time. And then uh, Alec and I put together this readers uh, Python script that we're pulling in and calling RD. So when I'm pulling a function from that um, script, it'll be RD dot the function name. And when I get to that, I'll open up that script too and uh, go through what I'm actually doing in those functions. So um, the ATL3 data is in regions, so a 14th of an orbit, there are 14 regions. And I just wanted to show these maps to get an idea of where the regions fall. Um, if you're looking at the Arctic, you'll probably be interested in regions three, four, and five, Antarctic, 10, 11, and 12. And in this tutorial, in, and in the ATL7 tutorial, we're gonna be looking at a granule in region four. And you can tell what region it is in by looking just at the file name. So again, the file name is uh, the data product and then the date and time here. And then the first four numbers of this are the reference ground track. And then the next two numbers are the number of times that ground track has been covered. So this is on the second cycle. And um, this is the region here, 04. And then the release and version. Um, also note that this is an older release because now uh, ver uh, release three is out as of like last week, I guess, um, but I didn't change that, so sorry. Um, but yeah, so this particular uh, granule that we're looking at in this tutorial is gonna be from February of 2019. So what I first like to do is, I've laid out the data location. This is the um, folder that I was talking about that is a shared folder. And then this is the file name and pulling it in with h5pi, just making this the file here, and then looking at one specific variable, which um, is important because uh, it's the orientation of the satellite. So if it's in, it switches orientation, um, and that's important because it determines the which uh, beam is weak and which beam is strong. So if it's in forward orientation, the right beams are strong. If it's in backward orientation, the left beams are strong. So I always print that out and make sure I'm using uh, the strong beams for my research. And it's just kind of good to have an idea of which is which. And if it's in orientation two, that's a transition phase. So don't use that data. Um, right. So then here I'm specifying which beam we're gonna look at. Um, the reader that I use only pulls in one beam at a time just because it makes more sense to me. Um, and specifying the file name and the beam name. And then this is from, this is a function from the reader script. Uh, so I'm just gonna go into the reader script and show you what this function does. Uh, so that is in the notebooks folder. Um, yeah, so basically when I imported this earlier, it imported all the functions that were in there. And to call any of these functions, I 
uh, made it so that you can just do rd dot and then it'll have uh, and then the function name. So um, for the get ATL3 one, we're pulling in the basic parameters here. Um, and first making arrays of these, like pulling it out of the HDF5 file, making them arrays, and then putting those arrays in a data frame, a pandas data frame. Um, and then that's what this function returns. So at the bottom, you'll see, I organize this into a data frame and it makes it a clean pandas data frame that you can visualize um, when this function is run. So um, the variables of interest here are the heights, the latitudes, and longitudes. Uh, those are pretty self-explanatory. And then the delta time is uh, a variable that's time since the Atlas epoch, and the Atlas epoch is January 1st, 2018. Um, so all of the delta time, uh, that is all in reference to this epoch. So we'll have to uh, convert that to UTC time and make it make sense for us to uh, look at. And then the confidence level is a little bit different because it's not an array, it's a matrix. Um, and the matrix is confidence level associated with each um, surface type. So for us, we're interested in sea ice. So this is the column two. Um, but also remember that Python is indexed so that the first column is zero. So um, we're pulling in the second column and then the confidence levels associated with that column. Um, and that will also be an array because it's just one of those columns. Um, and then this part's a little tricky. The way that the along track distance works for ATL3, um, there's um, a parameter that's at the same rate as the photons, and that is a long track distance within a section. I'm gonna call them sections because to differentiate between the segments in ATL7. Um, but the ATL3 data is split up into 20 meter sections. And each section will have uh, where it starts, how many photon events are in each section. So this is kind of like a pointer index scheme where you have to correct all of the um, section, the, all of the along track distances for each section. So um, this is also all available so you guys can look at and kind of digest more later if this is confusing to you. But basically just kind of putting the along track distance at the same rate as the photons and having it all referenced to the distance from the equator. Um, so that's what I'm doing here. And then finally, uh, making a pandas data frame, um, just calling it DFO3 and uh, using a dictionary to create the data frame where this column latitudes is associated with the array that I've pulled in from the HDF5 file lats um, and so on. Um, but yeah, just having the basic information coming from that and then returning, this is what the function returns here. So that's what's happening. I'm actually gonna run this as we go along. So let me do that. Um, this function takes a second just because, as I said, the data is huge and uh, it takes a while, a second to read in. Okay, now I'm just gonna map the data just to see where it falls. Uh, make sure I know what section I'm looking at. Um, so this is just really basic mapping with CardoPy. The first thing you have to do with CardoPy is um, create the figure and set the projection for that figure. Um, so I'm setting it as uh, the polar stereographic. And um, then when I do, when I add anything to the plot, I have to uh, make sure I reference which uh, coordinate system that data is in so that it can transform to the maps uh, uh, coordinate system. So here setting it as North Polar Stereographic and then making sure I'm specifying what coordinate system the data that I'm plotting in is when I do the scatter plot on top of it. And so this I've just plotted the heights here. Um, so these are the heights that I pulled in from ATL03. Um, 
and you can see it's cut off at that region four. So this is just showing region four. Um, yeah, so that's just to, to get an idea of uh, where this data is that we're looking at. Um, how are we doing? Are there, am I going at a good pace? Okay. I don't see any. Okay. Um, um, sorry, I just I have a quick question actually. Um, mm -hmm. When, so when you have the part of the script that is um, dealing with the along track distance, is that um, actually correcting the variable distance that um, happens with measuring sea ice, or is that just doing some smaller correction and we're still going to have to account for? that variable distance when we do statistics later. Does that make sense? Um, I think so. I mean, I, what I'm doing is the, the, this along track distance is just distance um, along the reference ground track in that coordinate system where uh, if, if the reference ground track, the center of all three beams, is x this variable will tell you how far along it is in x and then there's another variable that tells you how far along it is in y um so and what the manipulation requires here is just so that um because it's not given for every single photon what that along track distance is uh, i'm just creating that distance for every photon okay i see thank you yeah, I don't know if that really answered your question, but um, okay. And yeah, I'm going to plot versus, oh, okay. So first what I'm doing is I'm going to cut it to a smaller section so we can look at a smaller plot. Um, and the way that I like to do this, I know there's definitely a lot of ways to do this, is just create a little bounding box and then make like a true false array based on um, uh, making sure all the longitudes are greater than the longitude minimum, the longitudes are less than the longitude max. So this is just a true false. And then putting that in and cutting the data frame. So the, the resampling the data frame to this bounding box and making that cut version of uh, the data frame here. Um, and then what I was saying about the time, you have to convert it to uh, UTC time, or I mean, that's what I like to do. If you know how to use GPS seconds, you can, uh, or like understand GPS seconds easily, you, I guess you could leave it. But um, what you have to do is the delta time is time from the epoch. So pulling in what the epoch is, that's, that is a variable in the file. So you can just pull that in easily and then add that to the delta time, um, the, the delta time variable. And so I'm adding it to the whole column of delta time. Um, and so this, this result just right here is, an, is a full array of all the delta times um, plus the epoch. And saying that this is in the format of GPS and using this astropy time function to uh, translate it to a different time. So I'm, I like to look at it in UTC date time. I think Fernando yesterday was doing it in like decimal years or something, but um, this astropy time function is really helpful because it kind of takes in whatever and then puts it out in whatever you're, you want. Um, and it accounts for um, all kinds of um, time variations. Um, and then doing, for doing a long track distance within the segment, so instead of having it in all distances from the equator, I wanted to look at just the distance from this little segment. So I'm subtracting all of the uh, a long track distance X values from just the first value in this little cut segment um, so that we can plot versus distance too. So then here we have a cut data frame. So you can see these indexes don't start at zero even though you're printing out the head here. Um, the index values still say the same, which is kind of helpful. Um, and then having our variables of interest, the latitudes, longitudes, uh, a long track distance, heights, uh, delta time, confidence, the time that we've converted, and then the long track distance. Um, 
So I'm going to plot versus height versus time. And this is just um, an easy way to plot things, really basic matplotlib, plot plt.scatter. Um, and yeah, I'm plotting, the coloring is based on uh, the confidence. So I've made it, made it red and green with red being the um, low confidence and background photons. And then green is the medium and high confidence photons. Um, and you can see the medium and high confidence photons are uh, at the surface here. And then there's a lot of background photons uh, and the lower confidence includes the ridges too, but um, yeah. And then below the surface is these uh, background and low confidence photons and um, there's a, there, there's a lot more there than there are above. Um, and also there's not a lot above the surface right now because this is in February and also this is in the middle of the night. So it's a polar night and very dark. Um, so if this was in the summer, you would see more of these solar, uh, the solar background photons above the surface, but really we're just seeing all these background photons that are from subsurface volume scattering or like uh, the photons bouncing around in the snow and sea ice before uh, returning up to the satellite. Um, right, and so just also giving another option of plotting versus a long track distance, which is why I wanted to make that variable, just in case you want to have an idea of how far along the surface this goes. This one goes like 12 kilometers is the region that I've cut out. Um, the same plot, just different x-axis. Um, and then I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And I'm, by zooming in, I'm actually just changing the x limits of the plot to look at a smaller section, not resampling it again. Okay, and so this is just what one kilometer of data looks like. Um, you can see really strong return from the surface and then those background protons from below the surface. Um, yeah. And then finally, just to wrap this one up, because I think we need to focus on ATL07, um, just wanted to show the difference between the strong beam and the weak beam. So the strong beam, the, uh, just as a review, the um, ISAT2 has three beam pairs, so six total beams. And in, in each beam pair, there's a strong beam and a weak beam that are separated by 90 meters. And the strong beam has an energy level that's four times that of the weak beam. Um, and so that's what we'll see when we plot that, uh, the difference between those two. So here, yeah, I'm just pulling in the weak beam, which is the right beam, um, at the same way that I did before. So pulling it in with this function from the readers and then um, cutting it to the same bounding box that I did for the strong beam and then converting time to UTC and uh, converting a long track distance, making that additional column. Um, and yeah, okay. So once you do that, um, and then making another pretty simple plot uh, showing the difference between the strong beam and the weak beam. And these are 90 meters apart, so you don't, they're not like measuring the same ridges or anything, so you won't expect them to be really highly correlated uh, with like the surface features. But you can see here, there's still like a really, um, a pretty strong uh, return from the surface in the, the weak beam. Um, but this might not be as useful if you're, if there's like clouds, uh, the weak beam might not uh, have as good of a surface return where the strong beam might have just good enough so that you can see the surface. And yeah, I just wanted to show that difference. You Kiss, can probably figure out Kiss it. Kiss me, Helen. Mm -hmm. What is this figure for? Is this track over sea ice or us on land? What is the height for? Yeah, so the heights, that's a good question. The heights in ATL03 are um, reference to the WGS84 ellipsoid. And they don't have all of the same corrections that uh, ATL07 does. I'm actually going to go through that. It does have some corrections, but not all of them. So it d hasn't been corrected. Uh, it's not relative to the mean sea surface. It's not, um, hasn't been corrected for tides or for all tides. Um, but 
Uh, yeah, I'll go into that later because that is kind of not a super uh, meaningful height right now. It's like like the height relative to the ellipsoid is what it is. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, this is sea ice. This has all been sea ice. Ellen, can I also ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, why, so is like, what would a use case for the weak beam be? If it's like, if it's more prone to basically like failing in the case of clouds and it's not as strong as, it doesn't give as many returns as the strong beam, like what, what would be a use for it? Um, it is just additional data. So if you're looking for uh, more data and higher resolution, um, I, I guess the main reason that they have set up this weak beam is for land ice and looking at the slope um, between the two beams, uh, but that's not really relevant to sea ice. So it's main, the reason it's there is for land ice applications, but um, it can be useful uh, depending on what you're looking at. Like it, let's say you have a specific feature on the sea ice that you're looking at and the strong beam doesn't go over it, but the weak beam does. You could see if the weak beam is strong enough to um, show you what you're looking for in that. Um, but yeah, I don't use it. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to show the difference here. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I, I don't really use it much, but uh, I think we're still trying to figure out its potential use for sea ice. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to the ATLS 7 notebook. Um, okay, so this is the um, main sea ice data product, the one that we all want to talk about. And this is uh, sea ice heights. So ATLS 7, as uh, Alex said in the intro, was that last week? Or was that, I don't know. Yeah, last week. Um, this uses ATL03 and ATL09, the atmosphere product, to create these um, sea ice height segments. And each segment is an aggregate of 150 photons. And it can be um, as small as possible, up to 200 meters. Uh, so that's the resolution. Is uh, It's variable, but um, as low resolution as 200 meters, if that makes sense. Um, and again, this, the, the NSIDC is really helpful for having all of these resources in the same place, the data dictionary, the ATBD, which goes through a lot of details of the algorithm and then uh, known issues of this product. Um, right, okay, so in this notebook, um, I hope this is helpful based on what I've been hearing in the project meetings yesterday. Um, we're gonna go through, kind of, well, just the basics first, like what the groups are in the HDF5 file and how to pull it in. Um, and then kind of looking at the surface type classification um, and what parameters go into creating that classification. And then um, also looking at how the clouds uh, affect the returns. Okay. So importing pretty much the same modules as before. I think the only one I've added here is this scipy.interpolate, um, this interp1d function, which I'm just using to reinterpolate the um, ATL07 geophysical corrections to ATL03 to get them in the same vertical datum. Um, but I'll get into that more when I get down there. But yeah, and then also pulling in the readers again, because there's the ATL7 reader in there. Um, just a bit about the naming convention of ATL7. It's a bit different because instead of 14 regions, there's just two. Um, the Northern Hemisphere is 01 and the Southern Hemisphere is 02. And that is also indicated in the file name. So it'll be ATL07 and then dash whatever region it is. So if we're looking in the Arctic, we're gonna want uh, this hemisphere code 01. And then the same, back to the same naming convention as a uh, date, time, the reference ground track. So this is 1307 cycle. And then this is usually where the region code goes, but that's kind of meaningless here. I think it's all just zero one for all of them. Um, yeah, and then the release inversion. 
Um, okay. So again, the files that we're using in this one are in that same CIS folder in the tutorials data folder on uh, that's shared. Um, and also looking at just in here, pulling it in the same way and looking at uh, the orientation of the satellite to know which beam is strong and weak. Um, and then I just kind of wanted to go through some of the different groups in ATL07. So ATL07 is great because of that, uh, that segment height, but also it has so many statistics that could be useful for your research. Um, and those are all there and it's organized pretty well into different groups. So there's like the basic group with latitude, longitude, time, and um, a long track distance. And then the heights one, which will have the heights of each segment, the confidence, um, segment type, that's the surface type classification parameter that you guys seem to be interested in. Um, the sea surface height flag, which is kind of like a refined and simplified version of uh, the segment type. And then this Gaussian width, which is the um, distribution of the, the width, well, the width, the Gaussian width of the distribution of the uh, photons from the surface. Um, and then in stats, there's a lot, there's a lot more than, there's a lot more than what I'm saying here, but these are the ones that I'm pulling in for this, um, in this group, uh, which is in a different folder, is photon rate and the uh, cloud flag apparent surface reflectivity. Um, and then these are the geophysical parameters that I pulled in because they weren't applied to ATL03, but they were applied to ATL07. Um, and I'll need these to com to be able to compare ATL03 and ATL07. Um, so yeah, that's what that's what the readers function is gonna is going to pull in. So like before, um, specifying the beam and then going to this readers script to use this function, and then the output is a data frame. So just gonna quickly go through this. This is a lot less complicated than the ATL03 one. Um, there's, so these are all the things that I just mentioned, all the different variables I just mentioned in their respective groups. And in the same way, I'm pulling them out of the HDF5 file into arrays. And then at the end of this function, um, using a dictionary uh, to create a pandas data frame, which is what is returned from this function. Um, and again, you guys can look through this more if you're interested in how I did this. Um, right, so this is the output from that function. We have um, all these different variables that we're going to look at. And then I'm also going to pull in the ATL03 same track. So this is the 1307 track again, but the ATL03 um, so that we can compare ATL03 and ATL07. Uh, and I'm pulling in the same beam too. So, and using this function that I used in the last notebook. I'm not sure if I read these yet. Yeah, okay. Okay, so now I've pulled in the same beam for ATL, the same beam and reference ground track for ATL03 and ATL07. So we're gonna compare that. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the surface type classification. Um, there, the surface type parameter um, is, indicates like what, the surface is based on a bunch of different variables. So it goes zero is cloud covered, one is other, which is sea ice, and then uh, two through nine kind of specifies what um, kind of lead it is based on um, a decision tree that Alex showed in the presentation. Um, but basically the specular leads are the ones with high photon rates because you have that flat lead and like a lot of uh, returns come from a specular lead, that's the definition. A specular uh, and the dark leads are those leads that have a um, have um, a lower photon rate but are still classified as leads. So similarly, cutting it to a smaller region, a smaller bounding box here. Um, Going to do that for both the the ATL07 data frame and the ATL03 data frame here. Just making these. Um, quick cuts into the region that I'm interested in. 
Uh, okay. And so, as I've said, um, the ATL03 doesn't have all of the geophysical vertical corrections that ATL07 does. So in the process of creating ATL07, they make these extra corrections. And these corrections are stored in um, the ATL07 geophysical uh, group. And so what I'm doing here is interpolating them to the sampling rate of ATL03 and applying those corrections to ATL03 so that we can compare those with ATL07. Um, and I like looking at the ATL07 vertical datum. I'm converting ATL03 to the ATL07 uh, vertical because that is in reference to the mean uh, sea surface, which makes more sense than looking at what we're looking at in the last notebook where the heights were like 18 meters, which doesn't really make sense. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm doing here. This interp1d was from the scipy.interpolate library. Um, and what this, this line of code right here is doing is um, looking at a linear 1D interpolation between, uh, between the delta time values and the mean sea surface values and making that a function um, and doing that for all of the different corrections here. Um, and, then, and then applying this to the sampling rate of the ATL03. Um, so applying it to, because I've um, correlated these, uh, the corrections with the DT variable in uh, the ATL07 data frame, I'm just applying it to these, uh, the delta time variable in this, in the, in the ATL03 uh, data frame. And so here I'm making a new, um, column on the ATL03 data frame, the pandas data frame, uh, just called correction. That is a sum of all these corrections. Again, at the ATL07 rate resampled to uh, ATL03 um, and just interpolating that so that they are uh, applied at the photon level to every photon. And then making a corrected height um, by doing the heights from ATL03 minus this correction column that I just created. And so now we have, um, we have these two new columns. Uh, this is obviously erroneous, but, or like a background photon, uh, but these are more realistic values for uh, sea ice surfaces above the mean sea surface. Um, okay. So after I've done that, I'm gonna just map where we're looking at. I probably should have done this earlier, but just to show you, um, I do a lot of my work in the Lincoln Sea, which is right here between Ellesmere Island and Greenland. Um, and yeah, so I've been choosing a lot of tracks that go through the Lincoln Sea. But anyway, um, this is just a little section of data that I've cut it to that we're gonna keep looking at. Um, and then I wanted to make these subplots showing the relationship between the different variables um, that go into the class, the surface type uh, classification. So like I said, um, the surface type classification is basically based on uh, the surface photon rate, uh, the background rate, and kind of like the, re the relationship between, or the ratio between those. Um, and then also the width of the surface photon distribution. So here I'm gonna plot the photon rate and the Gaussian width. Um, and that's like, if you fit a, a curve to the uh, returns from the surface, that's like the width of that um, curve. Uh, and then this is, then I'm gonna show what the surface flag or the surface type shows you. Um, so what that surface type parameter is. And then, um, the next step in, in the algorithm, so this is kind of trying to just go through the algorithm in a, in, with pictures, because the next step after this surface type classification is refining it to make sure you're picking out specific um, sea surface heights. Um, so this is to create the sea surface height flag. Um, you refine these, uh, these instances that have been uh, noted as leads 
Um, and so you're looking at the lowest 2%. You're making sure that all these leads fall in the lowest 2%, which is what you would expect because they're lower than the sea ice surface. Um, and yeah, that final step, just make sure that they're really low values uh, at, before flagging it as a sea surface uh, segment. Um, so that's kind of the idea of going through this is like going through the algorithm to show how it works. Okay, so I'm gonna plot this. I just made, uh, let's see, uh, five different subplots and each one I just scattered information on and kind of did some cleanup with uh, setting labels and such. Um, but yeah, this is just basic plotting code in here. I'm not like skipping over anything important here. Oh, and then I've highlighted this region where uh, you, you are seeing that sea surface type. That is uh, a lead. Okay, so in this first one, plotting the photon rate. Uh, so it's pretty steady here. Um, and but you can see there's a spike here. And I've plotted the ATL segments that have been classified as a lead in blue. Um, hopefully you can see that well enough, uh, at least on your own screen. Um, but these are uh, here in blue and you can see that there's definitely a spike in the photon right here. And uh, that's because there's a lot more photons returned. Well, yeah, but more photons returned from a lead than there is from the, the CI surface. So that's one indicator that goes into uh, classifying the leads. Um, and then this isn't as prominent, but uh, in the Gaussian width of the distribution from the photons that are returned from the surface, um, you can see there's a little bit of a drop here uh, that is indicating that the width you would expect to be if it's a specular lead, you'd expect a bunch of photons returned at the same time. Um, and that would lead to like a narrow peak in when you're um, getting returns from the surface. So that's, you're expecting a smaller uh, width for uh, leads because they're flat. Uh, or the specular, yeah, they are usually flat. Um, okay, and so this shows the surface type classification. Like I said, there are 10 different surface type classifications. This one is the sea ice, so they're all sea ice until we get to this point. And then three is like a specular lead, is in the specular lead category. Um, and so all of these segments here that we flagged are uh, specular leads as uh, ATL07 defines it. And then the next step goes into like the revision of this to see if they can be flagged as sea surface heights and used to calculate freeboard in the next product. Um, and so that here, we're looking at the sea surface height flag where zero is sea ice and one is sea surface. Uh, and so these ones are in fact in the lowest 2% of data and are flagged as sea surface uh, tie points for the freeboard calculation. Um, are there any like big questions on that? Uh, I'm just gonna browse through the chat really fast. Okay, looks like people are answering questions. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. And Alex, sorry, I might use up most of your time. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm um, briefly gonna look at the impact of clouds on data. So now we're looking at that cloud flag. Um, I'm pulling in different, a different section here because I wanted to show an area that has a bunch of different cloud flags at once. Uh, well, not at once, but in the same region. Um, so pulling in, this one is from, this segment is from April and we're gonna pull in the ATL7 with the readers function. Um, and then just gonna map what we're looking at here. So this is, Again, goes through the link and see because I like the link and see. Um, and this is the cloud flag ranging from zero to six uh, across uh, the Arctic here. And you can see, uh, um, right, okay, so the cloud flag goes from zero to six with zero being high confidence clear, one is medium confidence clear, 
two is low confidence clear and then it goes low medium high confidence cloudy and six is unknown so i don't know what that means unknown uh yeah and so then i'm just going to zoom into or like subset it to a smaller region that has a bunch of different cloud flags in the same area to see how that affects different parameters um right so that information i just said is right here um okay so i've chosen a segment that was kind of in the middle of the arctic here um oh cool mapped this too uh, so that's that's the area that we're looking at, Central Arctic. Um, and then I wanted to compare cloud flag and photon rate variables. And um, the cloud flag, I think, is uh, based off of the surface photon rate. So like you is or it's related to it. Uh, they're related to each other. Um, so you can see that uh, when you plot, I'm plotting uh, the cloud flag on top, and I'm just showing cloudiness is increasing here um, on this scale. Um, and then the photon rate below that. Um, so the cloud flag here is going from low confidence clear to high confidence cloudy. Um, so you can see this is like a typical photon rate, maybe a little lower than usual, but um, yeah, and then it like drops when, you, when the cloud flag is increasing. So when it is high confidence cloudy, that's when you see a big drop in photon rate or return photons from the surface, which is what you would expect. And then I just want to show how that affects ATL03 data. Um, so pulling in this same track for ATL03, this again is from April, um, and cutting it to the same region that we've cut the uh, ATL07 data. Um, and then plotting the same thing that we plotted above and then also plotting uh, the ATL03 data. So this is what we had before, the cloudiness and then the photon rate. As cloudiness increases, photon rate decreases. That's pretty much what I wanted to show here. Um, and then also you can see uh, this is a really long section. I think it's like 13 kilometers. Um, but um, plotting the ATL03 heights, and you can see there's fewer returns from the surface when it gets really cloudy at the end of this region. Um, and also interesting to note, now that it's not polar night, you can see that there's a lot more background photons above the surface as well, um, compared to the other tracks that we were looking at earlier. Um, I'm just going to zoom in again because I like doing that. Um, cloudiness increasing from low confidence clear and low confidence cloudy to high confidence cloudy and seeing the photon rate decrease um, and then losing some of these surface returns. So you're not getting as good of a return from the surface here. And that will affect different things like the um, if you're not seeing as many uh, surface returns, um, then the ATL7 segments will be longer because you, it takes a longer distance to get that 150 photon aggregate, um, which changes the statistics. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to make that point clear that, this, that these things are all related. Um, so I'm done with this notebook, but it looks like we only have uh, 10 minutes. Um, I guess we're supposed to meet back in the main room at 1015. Yeah, I was just going to suggest, I mean, since uh, we have the tutorials and um, we want to record them and if other people uh, want to see them, just go through um, and people want to go over in the other meeting, they should do that. And but then we have them record it and then people can view them uh, at a later date. Does that sound okay? So you're suggesting we just keep going? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, I guess, so I'll take questions from these two notebooks. Actually, I'm going to go into um, the chat and the questions CIS channel and see if I can answer any more questions, but I'll pass it over to Alec to go through ATL 7 or ATL 10.
Yeah. Cool. Well, does anyone have questions about that thus far? There's been some good chat on the uh, Slack and the, the chat here too. Good. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. Yeah, I think one of the things people pointed out on Slack that I think you're we're using a release three ATL three granule technically and release two ATL sevens and tens. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out there is more and more going forward, those release schedules aren't exactly going to line up. Um, so, yeah, it, it might be that in the future you start to see that that maybe one of the products needs more releases because they have more algorithm changes that they need to implement. Um, whereas some of the other products might actually be pretty stable and they don't want to actually change anything. So they'll just kind of stick with the current release. So it isn't always the case that you need the releases to, to, to match up. Um, but yeah, obviously we want to make sure in general that we're using kind of similar input data when we're doing these um, comparisons. Um, yeah. I also wanted to quickly say, um, yeah, I think that reader's file, I think there was some problem with people accessing it, but uh, we, we've kind of just used that similarly to how we used it last year, which is a bit of a dump of um, potential data readers. Um, so there's, there's a couple of different versions of, of data reader in there. Um, yeah, we've generally found that everyone kind of has their own favorite way of reading in data. Some people want something very simple. Other people want something a bit more um, developed. So yeah, I think Ellen's is, is kind of nice and simple and there's a slightly more kind of convoluted version of an ATL7 reader in that um, script as well. Any more questions? Or shall I, shall I, yeah, shall I quickly just run through the ATL 10 notebook? Um, Michelle is asking, um, yeah, about kind of getting the latest release of data. I, I'm not exactly sure that exists, Michelle. Um, so this idea that, yeah, give us all the latest release. I don't know, maybe, maybe Walt knows about that if, if you're on the line, Walt. <laughs> no, it's just that, uh, you, Ellen, you said uh, that was version two and version three exists. So I was just wondering, is there a command to just download the, or you just specify the, the version and that's it. Yeah. Well, and also, the, yeah. Sorry, at the beginning, you just had the files already downloaded. I think that was a tutorial yesterday anyway, but it would have been nice to have the command that, uh, you know, you give the region and then you download all the Atlas files you're interested in for that region. Mm -hmm. I wonder. I yeah. mean, I think we've done that, right? But, yeah. I think I was working with Jessica, who was leading that Ice Picks tutorial yesterday, mm -hmm. and she was, uh, we put together a script that would um, download all of the, files that I used in this tutorial um, separately if you if you wanted to work on this on a different machine. Um, yeah, so I'll talk to her and see where that is and uh, I can point you guys towards that too. Thanks. Yeah and Walt's saying in the Slack chat that I think what I said was slightly wrong. So if ATL3 levels up then all the higher ones automatically level up the version. Um, whereas if a higher level version levels up ATL3 doesn't. Yeah, that's Alex as well. Yeah, that's my understanding. Um, uh -huh. I could be wrong, but I, I believe, you know, ATL3 is the basis for at least most of the higher level products. So I think if it versions up, everything else, at least eventually will version up. Um, mm -hmm. But but there could be improvements to the higher level algorithms beyond just the new ATL3 source. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, Alessandro uh, was asking about the ATL3 versus 7 plot and lead detection. Um, the flat areas looking like leads but are not classified as such. So maybe they're flat first year ice or leads missed by the algorithm. Yeah, I think, I don't know if you have a comment on that, Ellen. Um, have you looked at those sections much? Uh, in, in general, I think that ATL7, you know, lead finding algorithm is, is designed to be conservative. Um, we don't want to kind of misclassify ice as, as open water. So yeah, sometimes I think you'll see these areas that look kind of like leads and maybe they're refrozen leads, um, but they, they might not be um, yeah, designated as open water technically. So. 
definitely something to look out for. And, and that's the kind of tweaks that are being made still to the album. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, to agree with that, the um, new ice is not really reflective at all, so very reflective. So um, I, the way the algorithm works is looking at um, these spikes in photon rate, and you're not going to see that over um, newly formed ice. So maybe that's what that is, but I'm, I, again, it's hard to tell just looking at a bunch of little dots, like what exactly the surface is, but that it could be a, a lead that's just doesn't fit those qualifications, or it could be a new sea ice that's flat, but doesn't have a high photon rate. And that's why it wasn't flagged as a lead in, in that example. Yeah. Yeah. And, there, and there's some of the ones that we're kind of trying to actually get rid of in the release three, um, uh, ATL seven release because we were kind of seeing there are some of these regions which in this case they're not picked up as a lead but in other times they are and they, and when we've looked at some of the imagery um, that we have it does look like it's a refrozen lead and we don't want to be including that so yeah um, always a bit tough but yeah um, there's another question about the corrections from ATL seven to three um, does the ATL three data have corrections in it or are they only in the high level data sets? Um, I was just going to say that, yeah, in the, in the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation that I gave on Friday, there's some information about what corrections are applied. So and I think and, you have some in your notebooks too, right? Yeah. And in um, the ATO3, there's also a group that has uh, the, um, the corrections that are applied and the ones that aren't applied that are kind of leaving you on your own if you do want to apply them. Uh, the reason I didn't go that route and apply it straight from ATL03 to ATL03 is because the mean sea surface um, wasn't there and interpolated for uh, the ATL03 rate, but all the other corrections are. And it will say in the description of the variable, it'll say, um, this is a correction, but it was not applied to this data set um, for the things like the long period equilibrium and the inverted barometer corrections that I applied um, in this tutorial. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ted is asking in the chat if, uh, since new ice is not so reflective, e.g. like Nihilus, do you see reflections from the ice water interface, maybe broadening the return photon distribution and making it look lower than a lead? I would say that's an interesting research question. I don't have an answer. Do, do you know, Alan? <laughs> that would be great if someone who is doing that uh, comparison between imagery and uh, and I set two could figure out that question. That would be an interesting so, research topic. For that. I don't know if you can hear me. This is Ted. Um, I asked that because uh, my student and I have been looking at OIB data a lot and referencing to leads, and we've found that um, thin ice sometimes looks further away than the lead um, and have no idea why. And I was thinking that might be it. So I was hoping someone else might have seen that in ISAT too, or if anybody's done OIB data and seen the same thing, that'd be great to know. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say that, yeah, the, I've definitely seen that in the IceBridge data as well. And um, yeah, the IceBridge ATM team have often sent us kind of some weird examples of subsurface scattering in leads, which I still haven't seen a particularly good answer for. And I think then there's, there's been maybe a suggestion that it's like sediment or um, biology um, that may be kind of driving that kind of, as you're saying, for, for Nihilus and, and Frazzle Ice or whatever. So yeah, I don't think anyone's, I haven't seen a convincing answer to that yet. But okay. Definitely an issue for our ice bridge lead elevations. Yeah, so that, that it, I don't want to take up any time, but then we had a tough, because it was significant enough, it was difficult to decide what to, to take as a reference. So do you just take <laughs> things that were definitely leads? Yes. Because yeah. it's, it's just, yeah, because then you have this unknown bias. And I wonder if that might exist in ISAT too as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, I think Ron's talked about this before. He's, I mean, I think his opinion is that maybe we're going to find that the ISAT 2 lead elevations are going to be more reliable than ice bridge potentially so then uh maybe the, the referencing will go the other way around but uh yeah yeah it could be a waveform thing too right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah, and, and that's kind of why the, the Icebridge ATM team did release the waveform data set, which is at NSIDC now. And I think that was one of the things that hoping people will look at. And yeah, maybe improvements to that fitting. Um, so sh yeah, shall I quickly share my screen then, Ellen, and, and blitz through this ATL10 notebook? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I suggest we, we just go on. How, how long do you think you take for, for the ATL? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think this notebook can kind of stand alone. It, it really just follows on from what Ellen's um, talked about. Um, yeah, so, so I think let's, just a few minutes. Let's just go on, and those people yeah. who want to go and see the uh, talk, um, the Ohan and the main session in 1015, um, can, of course, do so. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll just try to finish it as close to 1015 as possible. Yeah. Does that sound okay? Sure. Okay, so yeah, this um, notebook, yeah, very similar layout to, to the ones preceding it. Um, yeah, it's the same ATL. Is this the same ATL7 granule? Actually, maybe we use a different one, Alan. Uh, let me just check. Okay, this is a different granule. Um, yeah, it's different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the hope is that this is flexible so you, can, you guys can just read in whatever granule you want. So again, let's just run this whole thing. Let's hope this doesn't crash. Um, Okay, so then, yeah, this is again another example of one of these readers. So that is in the readers.py um, um, file, but I've just put it in, in line here just so you can see what's in it. Um, so again, maybe this one has a bit more information. Um, we're reading in things like freeboard now and the, and the C surface height flag. Um, um, I think I mentioned in the talk on Friday that a lot of the data from ATL7 just simply carried straight through to ATL10. Um, so that's why it's often a good data set just to use first. Um, delta time, um, yeah, long track distance again, that's all the same as ATL7. Um, yeah, so that's all pretty basic. Um, so we use the same approach as the ATL7 notebook for um, just putting that all into a, a data frame. Um, here we're just plotting that data using CarterPy. Um, yeah, I actually jump into thickness. Well, yeah, there's some stuff at the end of this notebook that I want to maybe talk about first. So why don't we just quickly, I just want to highlight the stuff, extra stuff that I um, included at the end of this notebook. Um, so if you guys maybe have to run this whole notebook first. Yeah, I'm not going to kind of do this tutorial directly because I don't have too long anyway. Um, the point I wanted to mention is, or, or highlight here, is, is why ATL10 might be a bit different to ATL7. And what you'll generally find is that there's just less segments in ATL10. Um, so, you know, the main thing that's happening going from ATL7 to ATL10 is, you know, we find this reference C surface, um, as, as Ellen talked about, and then we just simply difference that reference C surface from um, the heights to derive a free board. But there are a couple of other things that then happen. Um, between seven and 10. Um, one of them is um, um, just some kind of coarse filtering. Um, one of those is, is reducing the, um, or increasing the CIS concentration threshold from 15% in ATL7 up to 50% in ATL10. And that's because of worries about um, waves um, in the sea ice. Um, another filter that's introduced is, is a coastal mask. So we have to have data that's um, more than 25 kilometers away from the coast. Um, there's another thing um, which I wanted to highlight here, which is um, you see this variable called freeboard quality. Um, and that derives from ATL7 and it's, it's really the quality of that Gaussian that's fit to those heights. Um, so yeah, there was some chat um, about what exactly that Gaussian is. And it's actually this kind of complicated two Gaussian mixture that's fit to that 150 photon distribution. Um, but there's this quality flag that indicates how good that fit is. Um, low numbers actually indicate it's a good fit. High numbers indicate it's a bad fit. Um, in release two data, um, we only let quality um, flags less than 
um, four be included as free board estimates, but that's increased up to um, less than and including four in, in release three. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show you what I mean by that here. So, so here I have um, a section of free board data. Um, so I'm showing the free board uh, in this top panel here. Um, but this isn't, um, the colors actually indicate this, what I call this freeboard quality. Um, what we can see is most of those are blue and that's where the freeboard quality is, is good. It's like a low value. Um, but some of those colors um, uh, indicate kind of a worsening of, of the quality. And you can kind of see that in this second panel here. Um, so a lot of those are one, that's like the best, best fit. So they nicely, those heights nicely fit a Gaussian. Um, but the quality flags of two and three indicate, indicate that that Gaussian fit is getting worse. Um, if you kind of eyeball that top panel, you'll see that a lot of those bad fits actually come from um, the higher end of the distributions. And, and we think some of that has been caused by, yeah, rougher, rougher surfaces, um, maybe not um, fitting a Gaussian as well as um, kind of level ice um, surfaces do. Um, so when you're using ATL10, you can kind of apply your own um, or even using ATL7, you can apply your own freeboard quality threshold. And so this is just providing an example of this. So here we're, we're kind of, um, let me just run that cell. Uh, oh, I did that up. Hmm. Um, but then what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm essentially creating a new array um, and I'm, I'm setting a kind of stricter freeboard quality. Um, and again, this is just an example of the kind of filtering you could do, but if you wanted to, you could um, look at other parameters in ATL 7 and 10 and use that to um, apply stricter filters. Um, and so then this, this final panel here, I don't know why they're not showing, maybe I need to run. I'm just gonna run this all. I'm just gonna wait for that to run. Um, okay. The bit that takes the most time here is this thickness stuff in the middle. I should have re, I might have to reorder this notebook a bit. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, there we go. So while that's running, I'm just going to go back. Um, uh, to what this notebook's really showing. And that's kind of how we can do kind of more science with the data. So what I've tried to do here is, is build on a notebook that I had last year and show how we can go from a free, a long track free board data set um, to um, a, um, a thickness estimate. Um, so I've included in the, in the utilities script, so utils.py, um, a few extra functions that, that might make that easy for you. Um, so one of them is get Warren data. So what that does is it, um, again, we can have a look at this. Um, is it basically just assigns the Warren snow depth um, density, um, snow depth and density climatology to that data frame. Um, so we basically loop through um, that given granule and assign, you know, we read what the month is and then we assign that depth and depth and density estimate to that data frame. Um, so that's what's being done in this cell here. So we can see we've got, you know, in this case, we've got freeboard, our freeboard quality, um, some other parameters. But then at the end of this data set, now we have the snow depth from Warren and the snow density from Warren. Um, so yeah, a pretty nice way of just, just reading that in. Um, obviously then to derive thickness, we need to do something a bit more. So I've included just the basic hydrostatic equilibrium equation. Uh, Right, so yeah, sorry, this is two functions. So this, this one basically reads in our, our data frame and then calls this function, which is freeboard to thickness, um, which is just the one below here. And that's the hydrostatic equilibrium equation, which um, we apply um, actually within the function here, a water density and an ice density. Again, you can play around with changing those values if you want. Um, and then we derive thickness based on the inputs of freeboard um, and snow depth and density. Um, so again, here we decide on what those snow depth and density values are. So these strings here indicate which kind of column of the data set we want to use. 
and then the out var here indicates kind of what we want to call that thickness estimate. Um, so yeah, when we when we run this, we then have this this new column which is a nice thickness estimate. Um, so we can see our free boards on the left and now result in ice thickness on the right. So yeah, just with a couple of lines um, there, we can go from free board to thickness. Um, I don't know why the figures aren't outputting. Uh, well, anyway, I don't want to spend too long on that. Um, I'll try and figure that out and get back to you guys. Um, the other thing I've done is um, applied some other snow depths. So there's the Nasosin snow model um, that was developed a couple of years ago in preparation for the launch of ISAT 2. You can find out more about that on the GitHub um, page. Um, and I've included in this repository um, the Nasosin snow depths that I used from this um, from the first winter season of data collection. So October 2018, um, so te technically August 2018 to um, the end of April 2019 um, and I've included just a couple of functions here to read in that data so again if we go to the utils um, file we can go to get an sim and that simply just reads in um, this um, data file and then assigns those snow depth and density estimates to that data frame um, and then we use that same function we used before the get snow and convert to thickness uh, to then use those new snow depth and density estimates to derive thickness. So now we've got um, what we should have, snow depth, density, and thickness estimates. Um, I think the reason why some of those are NANs is because there isn't an estimate to those specific points. Um, yeah, I think what I'm doing here is I'm cutting to the middle of the granule, um, more within the ice pack. And then you can see um, that we do then have density and um, um, snow depth and density estimates from the SOSIM and then um, results in ice thicknesses. So then we can kind of compare just, just eyeballing the thicknesses from Warren and the thicknesses from um, those in the SOSIM inputs. Um, yeah, again, I don't know why these um, plots aren't showing up. It's very strange. But Alex, anyway, I think yeah. you need to put the matplotlib inline command after the input, input block, and then it will work. So like after. So the cell one after cell two, then it should work. Okay. Thank you. Maybe. Good for me. Well, let's maybe not worry about that. Detail yeah. Yeah. Anymore. There you go. Thank well, you. Let's, um, let's go address that later and um, let's try to finish up as soon as we can. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is just really just to give you guys some kind of guidance on, on, on what you could potentially do with that data. But uh, yeah, that's all I had really. Um, feel free to yeah get in touch if you have more questions.